All right, uh, what we're going to do today is this. We're going to look at the rent-a-truck example, and we're going to finish that up as far as validation goes, because we can still illustrate some more validation points by looking at that. We are then going to talk about, but not do anything about right now, um, how we could improve the code. Uh, an important lesson, I think, to learn in all programming classes, and I try to stress it, is that a program that works, if a program works, well, let me phrase it this way, if a program works, that doesn't mean that it's a great program. That doesn't mean that it's an A-plus effort, all right? A program that works might be a C effort. It gets the job done. What elevates it beyond that is um, largely a matter of maintainability. How we can, can we expand upon it? Can we add features to it easily? Can we correct bugs easily? What happens if they want to change the user interface? You know, will that require a lot of work or will that require a little bit of work? And so on. So that's really what elevates um, an application from being good or okay or passable to being like a really good application. So what we're going to do after we work on the validation for the rent-a-truck example is we're going to talk a little bit about what the, some of the shortcomings are because it's not obvious always what some of the shortcomings are for a program that works, right? If a program doesn't work, we can say what the shortcomings are. It doesn't work, right? But if a program does work, we have to take a little more effort to look at it and see why it falls short and what we can do to improve it. Um, so we'll talk about that, but we won't do that this week. We will do that next week. And then we're going to look at a second example of a simple dice game. Um, and we'll do sort of the same thing with that. We will, we will get a basic version of it working, um, and then we will talk about uh, or we'll look at a basic version of it that works, and then we'll talk about um, what some of the shortcomings are, how we can improve it, improve it, and all that. And then we'll get into um, get into the specifics of improving it. The whole process of taking something that works and improving it is called refactoring. Um, it requires sometimes it requires some judgment. All right. Because here in school, I can talk about theoretically what the best coding practices are. You know, what you need to do and all that. But there are times in the real world that other constraints, time constraints, budget constraints, personnel constraints, might require you to not do as good a job as you could. You know, the real world isn't perfect and therefore as much as you'd like to do a perfect job coding an application, um, external circumstances may prevent you from doing that. But at the very least, if you recognize what could be improved, you'll understand the shortcomings of your current approach and, and might be able to work around them. And if you have the opportunity, we'll be able to fix them. So. I say this knowing full well that sometimes in the real world they'll say, you know, no, it's due today. You know, give me what you have today. Get it working. And you have to come up with code that isn't perfect. And that's just a, a reality uh, of the world. You know, you can't tell, you know, you can't tell your, your boss, you probably can't, that in one of Zeller's lectures he said that doing it this way isn't a good idea, that we should refactor it and improve it. And, your boss will have to say, who is this Zeller's person? I'm going to fire him if I find him. Uh, and if he doesn't work here, I don't care what he has to say. All right? So at any rate, let's look at the rent-a-car, uh, rent-a-truck example. And we'll finish up the validation for it, and then we'll examine um, the um, um, shortcomings of it and, and what we would need to do to correct it. Visual Studio. If 
file open website I'm going to navigate to where that lives which is this folder here open If I remember right, where we left off is there is no validation associated with the dates. Actually, I grabbed the wrong version of it. There are no dates. And this is the right one. Because it does have the dates. Um, we talked about the different validators. Uh, if we run this, if we do everything, if we enter everything correctly, it works. If we do not enter things correctly, we are likely to get an error. So if I enter everything incorrect, 9-7-2016, whoops, email, and sellers at LorraineCCC.edu, number of miles, 222, small truck, calculate bill, it gives me a correct answer. And I'm assuming that's correct. We verified it last time. Um, in the interest of time, I'm not going to verify it again, but I trust that that's still correct. So if we enter everything incorrectly, um, it does its job. And if we increase this by a day, it should go up to 206, I think. And sure enough, it does. Of course, we enter in garbage for one of these or omit one of them. It's going to blow up because we have not done any validation. We've told it that there's going to be dates in those fields. And if there isn't, then we're going to get an error on this instruction here where we try to deal with that string as a date. Try to process it as a date. So, therefore, we need to validate that. What else do we need to validate besides just making sure that there's dates in there? Right. That the end date is not less than the starting date. 
and uh, we have and we, we need to verify that that it's required as well now um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to go into uh, visual mode on the page I can't necessarily tell you like how do I want to put this? It's good to be it's good to be able to to work in both visual mode and code mode. I would hate if you did everything through visual mode by dragging and dropping and never looked at the code because some things are easier to do and some things if things don't go right, it is insightful to actually look at the code that is generated. On the other hand, the visual mode is there for a reason, and that reason is it adds a little bit of ease to the process. So by all means, don't shy away from the visual mode, just don't rely on it 100%. So I'm going to go first of all, and I'm going to add a required field validator. I'm going to do that because we saw the example before, if you put one of these other validators on, it doesn't necessarily work um, if um, there's nothing in. In other words, it will allow uh, an empty entry. So I'm going to put a required field validator on both of these. And I'm going to go in and remember for each validator, at the very least we have to specify which control we're validating. because I'm going to use it to compare to make sure that there's some relationship between those two dates. Namely, I'm going to make sure that the starting date is less than or equal to the ending date. So, error message I'm going to put. Starting date, or ending date, can't be before starting date. All right. For this, we have to specify a few other properties. We have to specify a type. We have to tell it that these are dates. And if you remember the illustration from last time, the reason for that is that different fields get compared differently depending on their data type. In other words, if you say it's a string, then one zero is actually less than two if you treat it as a string. If you treat it as a number, of course, two is less than one zero or ten. So in order to do the co comparison the proper way, you have to define it, you have to specify the data type for it. So you know to follow the rules for that data type. So I put in the data type. I put in the control to compare to. In other words, I am validating the start date and I'm comparing it to the end date. And what is the comparison? Well, what's the operator? The operator is that the start date must be less than or equal to the end date. So that should provide the validation. That should also make sure that we enter valid dates in there too. All right. So you sort of get that one for free. All right. So let's run this and make sure that it works. I'm going to go here and set the display of this guy to dynamic. If you remember what that does is...
the error message won't take up space if it's not there. All right, so I go and run this. If I don't put anything in, I get the validation there. If I put in garbage here, it gives me that validation message because it recognizes that there's something there, but it performs the validation and says that the starting date can't be less than the uh, can't be greater than the ending date. And if I put valid dates in, so if I say 9-6-2016, and it was returned 9-5-2016, it's going to complain about it. Whereas if I make them equal, it's going to be okay with it. All right. Any questions? All right. Now I'm debating if I should talk about this or not. All right. There's one other validation we probably should perform regarding dates. Anyone think of what that is? Well, depending on what this is and depending on how it's used, uh, we would want to make sure that the dates are both after, equal to or after the current date. I guess that depends on what, how this is entered. If you were like reserving a truck, then you couldn't enter in that I want to reserve a truck for January 1st, 2016, right? Um, However, if you are processing a contract that had already been finished, I might enter in that I rented it yesterday and I'm returning it today. So it depends on exactly how we were going to use this page, whether we would want to do that validation or not. Let's pretend that we do want to do that validation. All right, let's pretend that we do want to do that validation. How can we do that validation? Because from what I can see, there's nothing built in to say that I can validate to do that this is, that, that, the, that the starting date is um, the current date or earlier. So there's nothing built in to do that. Whenever you run into a case like this, where there's nothing built in to do what you want to do, you essentially have two choices. All right? two possibilities. One of them is that you can simply go off-road altogether and write it all yourself. We saw that there were custom validators and you could use a custom validator to validate to make sure that the first date was um, equal to or greater than the current date. So you could always do that. That's always a choice whenever you use a framework. And that's not just the ASP.NET framework, that's any framework. A good framework will allow you to go beyond the framework and do more stuff, do different stuff, that, that is do stuff that the framework doesn't allow. And if we did that, we'd have a number of different choices on how to do that. We could write some JavaScript, we could write some server-side script, we could write our own uh, control, we could write our own validator that inherited from another validator. So we'd have a lot of choices. Our other choice would be to say, hmm, can we shoehorn this in to something that does exist in the framework? All right? And that's a possibility I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pursue. I'm not going to pursue the custom code option. I'm going to pursue the option of, can we shoehorn this in? And if you think about it, really what I want to do is I want to do a compare validation. I want to do, I want to validate that the starting date is equal to or greater than the current date. All right? We just did a validation exactly like that, except 
it wasn't against the current date, it was against two text boxes. So maybe I can do this. Maybe I can put a dummy text box in here that has a current date. All right, that has a current day. All right, and then I can do a validation to make sure that my starting day is less than or greater than or equal to the current day. So let's try that. All right, I don't know if this is going to work. This is live television, and I might fall on my face here, but we'll give it a shot. So here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to put on my page a text box. Or maybe I even put a label on the page. Ooh. I'm going to put a label on the page. And I'm going to call that label. Put no text in it to start out. I'm going to call that. That label isn't going to work. Why won't a label work? Because these validators work only with form controls, and a label isn't a form control. So I'm back to doing a text box. So I put my text box on the page. I will give it a value of, or an ID of, txt current. All right. So now I got the text box on here. I have to get the current date in there. How do you suppose I'm going to do that? Pardon me? The calendar, um, maybe, might even be easier than that. It's probably a function. It's probably a function, right. That should almost always be your answer on how I'm going to do something. There's probably a function. Now, finding the function might be harder than that, right? But at least you know where to look. This is an object-oriented world. If you think about it, we've already seen that there are objects for dates, right? So it's not unreasonable to think that there is going to be a function on that object to give me the current date. All right? So let's Google it. I think it's date That sounds about right. Date time dot now. Excellent. All right. So where do we put that? We've written code that goes in a button, right? We want to have code that executes as soon as the page loads. So if we look at this, there's actually a page load event. that We can go in and we can put code in there that says, do this when the page initially loads. So I could say txt current dot text. equals date time dot now. And I bet you we get a squiggly line. Why do we get a squiggly line? Because they're not the same data type. This should be a common theme for you. All right? When you see a statement that looks right, but it's telling you there's something wrong with it, Probably because it's a data type issue. Not always, but oftentimes it's going to be that. So how do we fix that? Two string. All right. So 
now we run it, and again, I can put my validator on here, all right, but I notice I'm doing a bit at a time, all right, doing a bit at a time. Why am I doing that? Because if this doesn't work, then nothing I do after this is going to work. If this doesn't pull up the current date, then I'm doomed the rest of the way. So why even try putting the validator on if I'm doomed? So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to say, and voila, the current date is in there. All right. Now, what don't you like about the current date? It has a time, right? I'm only entering a date here. My guess would be if I did that validation, it's going to tell me that that's earlier because it's going to use no time, which effectively is midnight, all right? And it's going to compare midnight today with 10 a.m. today, and it's going to tell me that midnight today is before 10 a.m. today. So we have to get rid of that time portion of it. How do you suppose we can do that? Pardon me? Take out the word time. Take out the word time? Um, well, let's see. Unfortunately, that doesn't work. Um, it doesn't work because all dates are really date and times. So what we want to do is we want to take the date and time and we want to format it to only show the date part of it. So how do we do that? Well, we can Google C sharp format date time. And if we look at that, first one two all right looks like this will do something about that so we scroll down and look for an example two string and if we put a lowercase d in there, that will do it. So this says. It's kind of fun to look for answers on the web, especially if you go to certain sites. Like if you go to like the official Microsoft site, it's pretty boring. But if you go like somewhere like Stack Overflow or something like that, um, you'll get your answer maybe after you sift through five pages of arguments and, and, and name calling and you know where did you learn the program and that kind of thing all right and eventually if you sift through it you can you can maybe come up with an answer um, some people some people have a lot of time on their hand maybe they should take up playing Pokemon Go so they're less argumentative on these online forums all right at any rate let's try this Ah, looks like we have a winner. So now, what I'm going to do is I'm going to put a compare validator that's going to compare the current date.
So I'll go and set the properties of that. My message cannot be earlier than current day. Um, Control to validate is txt star. Control to compare is txt current. Operator is that the current must be greater than or equal to the to that date. And the type is date. So if I put in nine seven twenty sixteen, it gives me that error. It cannot be earlier than current date. All right, which is what we want. Or if I put in nine eight, it works. Yay! Now we have a little bit of a problem, right? I, I, and I don't know if it's a problem or not, right? We're showing that, and it's a text box so someone could edit it, all right? Well, what can we do? We could do a lot of things, all right? One thing that we could do is make a read-only. Could we make it invisible? No, we don't want to do that because we saw before if you make something invisible, it doesn't create it on the other end. So we can't use ASP.NET to make it invisible. But guess what? We could use to make it invisible. We could use CSS. So I could go here in my page and say, oops, what did we call it? We called it. TXT current, I could put in style that said pound sign TXT current. Visibility. in an earlier date and it still does that validation you know we can't see the current date. Now I notice something when I'm doing this. There actually is a value to compare. I might have did a lot of work for nothing. It wasn't a lot of work but I might have done some work for nothing. In other words I could hard code a value to compare can I say date, time, now? And get rid of this. Why not? 
because that thinks it's, it's looking for the, the words date, time, now. So I can't do that. So the good news is I didn't do a lot of work for everything, for, for nothing. I guess that's the good news. All right, why, why did I go through all this? <laughs> yeah, why, why did you do this? I went out through this to show you that if you have some functionality that you want, that isn't in the framework, one of your options is to sort of stretch the framework to accommodate it. This wasn't really that hard to do once we thought of the, the technique of putting a text box there that contains a current date, a couple of minutes to figure out the instructions to stuff it with the current date, then we write our regular compare validator, which we know works, all right, and then um, um, a little bit of CSS trickery so that we can hide that. So it's on the form, but it's hidden now. All right. So it really didn't take a lot of uh, a lot of effort to do that. Now there's variations on how we could have done this as well. There's there's a lot of different ways that we could have tricked the framework to get this to work. But the point is, is I simply how do I want to say it? I simply, I, I hate to use the word twist or stretch. Maybe stretch is a better word than twist. Because I didn't do anything crazy here. But I got the framework to do something that I wanted it to do that it doesn't naturally do. All right? So I sort of nudged it and extended the functionality a little bit by putting a little bit of my own custom coding in there. And that's always a possibility. Whenever you have something in the framework that mostly does what you want it to do, but doesn't quite, all right, a lot of times by a little cleverness and a little bit of coding, you can get it to do what you want it to do, all right? Now, the question becomes, at what point does that little bit of stretching become a lot of stretching and becomes more trouble than it's worth? That's a judgment call, all right? Sometimes it's better to simply throw up your arms and say, hey, I'm going to write this all from scratch. I'm not even going to bother trying to shoehorn this into the framework. I'm simply going to write my own code that handles this and forget the framework for this piece of functionality. Now that's just, that takes time and experience to figure out. All right? The better that you understand the framework and its capabilities, though, the better you're in a position to make that call. So, in this course and in your future ASP.NET development, always be aware that you can stretch the framework to get it to do something that it doesn't ordinarily do. All right? And a lot of times, if you can do that without tons of effort, that's a better way to go. Right? Because I didn't have to write my own date validation here. I just had to write a couple of, of statements here and there that really didn't take a lot of effort. So sometimes it's a little effort you can get the framework to do something that it wasn't originally intended to do. Other times you're better off just doing it by yourself. You know, think of it like if you buy some clothes, right? If you buy some clothes, um, a lot of times it might be better to buy, say, a jacket, let's say, that maybe is a little bit too big for you, all right? And then you go to a tailor and have them, you know, take it in here, take it in there, whatever, shorten the sleeves, whatever, all right? Sometimes, though, it would be better to say, forget this, I'm going to go and just have a jacket custom made for me, all right? Not that I have ever done that, all right? Now, what's the difference between doing a custom made? Well, you know, it's going to cost you. It's going to cost you in terms of time and effort and money, all right? Whereas if it's possible to tweak it, all right, um, and just do make some alterations to it, it's going to end up being cheaper, quicker, and so on. Now there will be a point, for example, if I had a, if I had a small jacket and I took it to a tailor and said, alter this to fit me, there'd be a point where the tailor would say, you know what, it's, it's more trouble than it's worth to try to alter this tiny jacket to fit your six foot three inch height. It'd be better for me just to make a jacket for you. All right. So again, you can tweak the framework and you can 
put some code around to get the framework to, to, to extend the framework and get the framework to do something that it wasn't originally intended to doing. And sometimes, many times, that's easier than writing the solution from scratch. Sometimes it will be easier to write it from scratch. All right. I think I repeated myself like a dozen times, but it is an important concept to have. All right. And we'll certainly see other examples of that. All right. I was reasonably confident to make this work because I know how the compare validator works. I know there's functions to get the current date and time, and I know that I can hide a text box. So I knew the framework, so I was pretty confident I could easily do it. And the more that you know the framework, the better position you're in. All right. So we've done this. This, I don't think there's any more validation or anything else we can do. I think this is functioning the way that we wanted it to work. And yet, I would say that this still isn't good code. This is okay code. It isn't good code. And when I talk about the code, typically I'm not talking about the ASP page, the ASPX page. Yeah, we could do some things. We could make it look better. We might be able to organize it a little bit differently and so on and so forth. But... Really, I'm talking about the code behind. What is wrong with this code behind? It does the job that it was intended to do. What is wrong with it? It's a hard question to answer if you're only thinking about this page. Because if you're only thinking about this page, there doesn't really seem to be much wrong with it, right? You click the button, it does its job, and you have an answer. Where it becomes clear, yes? That's a good question. We'd have to test that. I think it would still work. All right. I think it would still work if we uh, put in um, fractional times because we're looking at it as a double. So I'm thinking that would still work. Uh, the date. Um, the formatting of the date. How so? Oh, I think that's handled. Yeah, I think, I think the validation is handled. So, like, if we put in for the date, two, it gives me a validation error. We could maybe reword that validation error, but it's, it's not letting something like that. In fact, it's even smart enough to know, if I'm not mistaken, Oh, well, maybe not. Yes, it is. I use a period. Okay. I think we have to enter it in this way. And we should we should explain that. All right. The problem really relates to where this code lives. All right. And what do I mean by where this code lives? Yes. So what we talked about like last year in the iOS programming class where we created a separate file where our code basically lives. Yes, exactly. Okay. All right. That's what we're going to come to, that we're going to take this code and put it in its own file. All right. The problem with this is right now, the only way we can do this calculation, this calculation is associated with the button click event. That's the only place that we could do this. Let's say we had a different page. Remember, we talked about how this calculation could be on several different pages, right? We could have the reservation where you reserve your truck and say, I plan on renting the truck on 9-12 and use it until 9-13 and I am going to drive approximately 100 miles. And it would give you an estimate of how much it's going to be. I actually did that when I rented a truck, all right? I rented a truck this past weekend, 
And when I reserved it, I said that I'm going to rent it this day. I'm going to bring it back this day. I'm probably going to go this number of miles. And it told me, well, here's your estimated fee. All right. So you could use this calculation to estimate the fee when you make your reservation. Right. Now, when they go and check you in, when you are all done and you go to return the truck, and they get the actual mileage that you had, all right? And you type in, you know, you type in that, you know, it went, you know, you went, you didn't go 100 miles, you went, you went 95 miles or something like that. And it actually prepares your bill. The calculation could be done. The same calculation is going to be done. So we could have two different pages, one that a customer uses on the public website, one that may be an employee for, the, the, for u haul or whatever the truck rental company is, uses on a private application. When I, checked, when I checked in my truck, the guy didn't take me inside and work on a computer, the guy pulled out his phone, all right? And I thought at first that he was playing Pokemon Go or something and checking to see. But no, he was actually checking me in. He called me up and, you know, called up my record, put in the actual number of miles, put in the fuel level, blah, 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 went and saved it, and it billed my credit card. That being said, we would want that app, which could be a series of web pages that are restricted to just the employees, and my reservation, which is part of the public website, to use the same code in calculating. Because imagine what it would be if it used different code. Imagine if I said I was going to I was going to take it out today, return it today, drive 100 miles, and it told me my bill was $60. How would I react if I went in, if I brought took it out today, returned it today, drove exactly 100 miles, and it told me that my cost was 65 miles, or $65. I'd be annoyed. They're trying to cheat me. They told me it was going to cost one amount, and now it costs something else. So those two different web pages better be using the same code. Otherwise, you're going to have some irate customers. All right? The problem with this is, if I had to go and write that page for the U-Haul employee to do this calculation and to bill my credit card number, right now, I would have to copy and paste this code and put it on that other page. Well, what's wrong with that? Well, what if something changes? All right, what if the, the rates go up? And, and what if the mileage goes up? What if the rule changes so the time matters? In other words, you get charged for fractional days. There's two places I have to make those changes. As soon as you hear that if one thing changes, I have to change two things, a siren ought to go off on your, in your head. All right? The reusability police are coming after you. All right? The maintainability sheriffs are coming to arrest you. All right? Because one thing changing should require one change to software or changing the software in one place. It might be more than one change, literally. But you shouldn't have to, just because one small thing changes, make that same change in several places. So what we're going to do, and we're not going to do it today, we're just going to talk about it today, we'll do it sometime next week, is we're going to move this code someplace else. We're going to move this code someplace to where it can be shared among different web pages. All right? So it doesn't matter if there's a public page where there's drop downs and maybe there's a U-Haul employee page where there's radio buttons instead of drop downs or whatever, the code, the back end code that does the calculations and implements the business rules will come from a common place and therefore you'll get consistent results. All right, that's what we'll do next week here. So. There's so nothing wrong about this code if this was the only place we would ever imagine ever, ever, ever using that. The problem is, is you can never make that statement. There's always a possibility that you might use this code elsewhere. In which case, it's a business rule. We should separate out the business logic from our user interface. This is a common theme in all of software development, right? 
in HTML, we separate our content, that is our HTML, from our CSS. All right? We do that to make it easy to change one without affecting the other. Same idea here. We can separate out our business rules from our user interface, and we can change one without affecting the other. All right? Um, just like in CSS, you could change the background color of your page, and every page on the site gets a new background color. We can change our business class for calculating truck rental fees, and every page that uses that class will get the new calculation. We'll go over that next time. What I'd like to show you now, though, is a game. And this game is already out, um, is one of the examples that I posted for this week. And there's actually a couple different versions of the game where I go and refactor it and improve it and so on. Um, I downloaded the first example, let's see what that is like. It's a dice game called High Low. And high-low works like this. You roll two dice. Before you roll the two dice, though, you predict whether the results are going to be high, low, or seven. By results, I mean the sum of the two dice. So, what are the values that two dice could have when you roll them? Could be two through twelve. Right? You could either have two ones is the lowest, two sixes would be the highest. So, low is two through six. Make my choice. I can pick high, low, or seven. 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 Eh, you lost. Yeah. 
Now, I'm not keeping track of the wins and losses. That, I think, is in a future enhancement. But you'd have just lost whatever you bet. All right, let's try another one. Love? <laughs> you lost. Let's try again. It's rigged. See, that's the thing. It doesn't need to be rigged. It's already, the, the rules rig it against you. Let's pick high. I lost. Whatever you're going to pick is going to be opposite. Well. I won. Yay. See, you win once in a while. All right. Okay, let's look at the code that does this. All right. Pardon me? Yeah, it uses a random number. All right. Code that does this is pretty simple. We have our web page. We have a drop down. We have a button. We have a validation message saying that you must make a selection. We'll look at that either today or next time. We have two images. All right, two images. And then we have a label for the results that says if you win or lose. All right. Let's look at this validation control. Let's look at it now. I lied. I said we'll look at it later. Validation control says it's going to validate the drop down. It says the initial value is a negative one. The reason that you have to do this is, is this. A drop down always has a selected value, right? If you have a drop down on a web page and you haven't selected anything, guess what gets selected? The top item. The top item is the one that's selected. So I added to this drop down a dummy choice. Please make a selection. And the value I gave for that is negative 1. So on my validation control, I tell it that the initial value is negative 1. That means that if the value of this dropdown is negative 1, then the user has not made a choice, and therefore there should be an error. So if I go and run this, if I leave it on please make a choice, it tells me to make a selection. Whereas if I change it to any of the other ones, then I do have a selection. That's important to know. If you're going to use a dropdown on a web page, if you don't specify a default one way or another, it's still going to have a value. And that value will be the top item on the list. So I think that's a little different than doing um, Windows C Sharp programming. I think in Windows you can have a drop down that doesn't have a value. I think. In web programming, a drop down always has a value. And if you haven't specified, the value is the top value. So you have to make that top value special by giving it sort of a dummy value um, if you want to validate it. Okay. So we press the button, and what happens? Well, you're absolutely correct. We have. An integer for the value of the first die, an integer for the value of the second die, a integer for the total, an integer indicating whether we won or lost, and an integer indicating the user choice. I create a random object, a random number generating object this way. And I roll the dice twice. That's the syntax for generating a random number between 1 and 6. All right? The way here. So it generates a random number between 1 and 6. I add those two together. That represents the sum of the two dice. I then take 
and I grab the selected value of the drop-down. What, what are the values for the drop-down? Low has a value of 0, 7 has a value of 1, high has a value of 2. So I go and say, if the user, I assume the user, lo the, the user loses. Yeah, I was going to say the loser uses. No, I assume that the user loses. So I initialize B1 as false. All right. I could actually assume that they win, and then I would write my code opposite of this. All right. But a lot of times when you write code, one way seems a lot clearer than the other. In this case, it makes a lot more sense to say, hey, I'm going to assume the user lost, and then I'll write code that will set the value if it changed. I grab the user's choice, convert it to an integer. I look to see if the user's choice is 0, and the dice total is less than 7, that means that they won. If the user total is 1, and the dice total equals 7, they've also won. Finally, if the user total uh, choice is 2 and the total is greater than 7, they've also won. If they've won, I put to the result, you won or you lost. Finally, I set the image. I set the image URL of my two images. Here's my two images. They start out having no values. All right. I then set the image URL to be image, images, slash D. I concatenate the number, the value of the dice, and then I add dot PNG to it. I do the same for the second dice. I actually have in an images folder a an image for each of the possible values for the dice, D1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, and I form the name dynamically by taking the value of the dice that was rolled, and I set those images URL to be the images from the dice. I then make the, vis make the panel visible. Um, I actually put the results in a panel simply because I didn't want to show the panel with possibly a broken image um, until we've actually rolled the dice. So um, a panel is an effective way to show or hide a section of a page. You can put everything in a panel and then you can show it or hide it as you need to. So I put the dice and the label in a panel and I only show that after they've rolled. Pretty straightforward. All right, pretty straightforward. Again, we could do better than this, though. All right, so take a look at this example. Take a look at the other versions of this example and think about how we could do better. Well, same thing like with the rental truck. What if we played this game on more than one page? Well, that's a possibility, I suppose. All right, we could have this on a couple different pages, but I don't know if we'd do that. This isn't that great of a game. All right. We could, however, have different dice games on different pages. All right. We could have one game for Yahtzee, you know, one page for Yahtzee, one page for High Low, one page for some other dice game. And if we were to do that, there's certain functionality for dice that we might want to put in a common place for the exact same reason. So if there's a bug with the dice, we don't have to fix it in five different page places. We fix it in the one place, and everything's okay. All right? So again, this code, like the code in the rent truck example, lives in one place and one place only. So if we wanted to do something similar to it, we would have to copy and paste and modify it. It would be a lot nicer if we could make a die or dice component, all right, that we could put anywhere on any page that required dice, that we were playing a dice game on. And then we won't have to rewrite any of that code. We just use what we've already written. 
So we're making sort of our own custom problem domain logic classes. All right, we'll pick up on this next time. We'll see you in lab.